The following is a Journeywise Network production. Hey friends, welcome to this week's You Matter podcast. I'm Shane Stanford. This is an unusual episode because we usually have a guest on that we're interviewing about some crossroads in their life. But with uh, several things happening in the news lately, uh, we decided to do a, a very special program and looking at what I believe is one of the most important issues for people of faith to consider today, and and particularly given the fact that we're entering into another election year, and why I think it is so important for us to to think carefully about what policies and what opinions we have. And um, recently, of course, Hamas, which is a, um, a terrorist uh, organization centered in the Gaza Strip, militants surprise attack on uh, members of the Jewish community uh, considered to be some of the most heinous events that we have seen happen in Israel uh, since 1948. And that has been the opinion of the Israeli government as they have shared what has happened and trying to bring some sense to what direction they go forward next. This is an interesting issue because it was 30 years ago at this time that the Oslo Accords happened in 1993. And for many of you, um, you maybe don't know the Oslo Accords. Whenever we think of Middle East peace, a lot of people think of Jimmy Carter and the Camp David Accords, which is where Israel and Egypt came to a conclusion. But in, in 1993, uh, it was the Palestinian Liberation Organization and uh, the government of Israel came to an accord that basically created what we know as the de facto state of Palestine, which includes uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, which is a, a section of land uh, that goes from the western bank of the Jordan River uh, all the way up into East Jerusalem. And, uh, and so they have been carrying on now for three decades uh, in this particular arrangement. What happened with Hamas, though, is Hamas has basically taken control of the uh, from the Fatah government that had been in charge of the Gaza Strip, and uh, they decided to attack Israel based on a long list of things that they said they were doing this in retribution for. What really we have happening here, though, is we have religion that has gone to an extreme. And what happens when extremism builds up in a religion, and it doesn't matter which religion it is, they're going to make decisions that are going to lead to uh, an unreasonable experience, not just between that person uh, or between that group of people, uh, but can have rippling effects all throughout uh, the world. And that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, the FADA government, which is the primary government in charge of the PLO or the or the Palestinian Authority are disavowing, of course, what the Hamas has done. And Hamas has a long history of, of problems that they've created, and they have been considered a terrorist group uh, for many years now, according to the UN. Uh, they are backed specifically by the government of Iran, and, uh, and it just sort of peels back the layers on differences that are in the Muslim community. Most Christians think the Muslim community is just one group of people. Uh, that believe the same thing, and nothing could be further from the truth. It's like Christianity in that there are many denominations, but primarily two different groups. You have the Sunnis and the Shiites, and it all has to do with who took over leadership after the death of Muhammad as to which group you fit into. Uh, Saudi Arabia, those are Sunnis. They are um, uh, very much uh, following uh, the wasabi arm of, of, of Saudi Islam, and therefore, because they have two of the most important sites, Mecca and Medina, uh, they are considered to be leaders. Now, you have the Shiites, uh, which uh, are a whole other group that's primarily in Iran. And uh, you think of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, and, of course, that whole group in the 1979 uh, revolution. Why is this important to Christians today? Well, it's important for a variety of reasons, but mainly it's also uh, important because it's a warning to us. Uh, today, as you think about Christianity, I believe it has one of the most important times in history for it to be uh, faithful to the walk of Jesus. 
And yet so many of our churches are doing anything but that. In fact, they've taken theology, which is the study of God, and they've put in ideology as their theology, which of course makes human beings the center of what they consider to be valuable and what they believe. And if you look at what's happened in the Middle East uh, between Hamas uh, and the Jews, is you have this extremist uh, version of Islam that has, because they feel that there's no other repercussions, they've attacked the Jews, even when uh, other bodies of leadership in the Muslim world were very much uh, working with the Israeli government and trying to keep this peace that was set way back uh, again in the Oslo Accords of 1993. And so this extremism keeps pushing the line, pushing the line, until eventually uh, militants are going to take matters into their own hands and you have what's happened in Israel. When you think about the groups that we are often seeing now in the United States in terms of our own faith, uh, individuals who come from very extremist, far-right, uh, almost neo-Nazi groups, uh, a lot of them will use other phrasing like uh, nationalists and uh, white supremacists, but these are groups that are basically the militant form of Christianity, just like Hamas is the militant form of Islam. Now, the problem with this is that Christians can agree that, or, or they, can, they can rationalize that they aren't the same, but in fact they are. They are the same types of extremism that pushes a, a religion, a faith, to making decisions, living in a certain cri criteria that ultimately will uh, only lead to danger and to violence. Jesus talks a lot about this, uh, not specifically about uh, extremism, but he does talk about what happens when the organization of religion begins to become more important than the actual experience of the faith. I'll say that again. When the, uh, the expression of the religion becomes more important than the experience of the faith, and his ire was always focused on the, the Pharisees. Uh, there's this one great scene where Jesus is talking about poverty and about worry and about what you'll wear and what you'll eat. And you get the sense that, given the setting, that Jesus is talking over the heads of those who would be the most poor, the most vulnerable, to the group in the back, the ones who are the Pharisees, the leaders who are standing there, who are usually the ones who are making judgments and pronouncements about the poor, uh, about what a person should or should not have, what they should or should not be able to experience. And the Pharisees had really become not just the, the more staid, structured part of the faith, but they had really become um, very set in their ways to the point that they were kind of pushing the bounds of what it meant to be a, a people of, of faith. And they had created a set of rules. Now, what's interesting to me is that uh, after the Ten Commandments, there were over 600 smaller rules or commandments that the faith had established that, that a Jewish community would li live by. In order to keep the Ten Commandments, they had over 600 small rules to keep those commandments. And what happens is, is over time, the keeping of the rules becomes the primary focus of the faith than the experience of the spiritual uh, you know, endeavor itself. And let me give you some examples. Uh, by the end of the first century, uh, of after Jesus' uh, resurrection, uh, there started to be heresies based on a, a local experience of faith. You had the heresies in Alexandria, you had heresies in Antioch, and uh, one of the most uh, difficult heresies that came along in, in the first part of Christianity was the Gnostic movement. Now, all three of the Synoptic Gospels had already been written, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they had told the story of Jesus pretty much from the same timeline. But John comes back and says, no, we need to talk about Jesus and we need to talk as much about his divinity as interrelated to his humanity and vice versa than we do just a, a list or a timeline, not just to be synoptic about it, but really to talk about the essence of Jesus's humanity and divinity. And that's where the Gospel of John came in. And so John wrote the Gospel of John to respond to a first century heresy that in itself had gone to extremes. And here's what heresies do, friends. Uh, once they set a pattern or they set a direction, 
they'll have to create other patterns and other decisions in order to keep that moving and keep that conversation going in the direction that they can have control over it. Because it's all about power and control at that point. It's about who's going to make the decisions, who's going to be the ones who are going to be in charge of setting, uh, setting the, the, the boundaries of the faith. And that's what's happened time and again throughout Christianity is you'll have a, a, a group that will experience some power, some legitimacy, that'll take on one particular rule or uh, one particular belief, and they will carry that to such an extreme that before long it is the belief itself that they're worshiping and not the relationship with God. That's why everything throughout uh, Jesus' time was based on relationship. That's why it was so important uh, to, to keep talking about relationship and experiencing relationship because it was in relationship, the back and forth between our God's communication to us and our communication back to God, that we were able to, to know and be known, that we were able to experience the power of what God was doing in this world, but at the same time go on and also experience and live that as brothers and sisters together. When a particular group shuts itself off from the expression of that relationship, then eventually what will happen is that group will uh, begin to think it is the only one who has the connection or the only one who has the right belief. And that's what's happened in the Middle East, is you have these groups, these small groups like a Hamas, that have decided that they are the, the ones that have uh, the only real course of belief, the only true belief, and therefore, no matter what their brothers and sisters in the Islamic faith are doing, they have the real answer, and they're going to push forward, even if it becomes irrational and doesn't make sense. The same thing happening with our Christian beliefs. And therefore, we have to be very careful. But This raises its head in particular through elections. Uh, when people are, are asked to choose in a particular candidate or not, and they'll maybe vote for a candidate because of one issue, but they disagree with that candidate on nine other issues. John Wesley was very clear to his early Methodist brethren and, and sisters when he said, you know, no matter who you're going to vote for, make sure that they exhibit the values that you believe Christ would want you to have in your life, not just on a particular issue, but do they have the, the whole set of values? Do they live faithful to what the whole of the gospel is? That's number one. Number two, that you're not going to disparage another candidate in order to talk positively about your candidate. John Wesley was very big into that, that all that negative talk does is lends itself to more negative thought, more negative thought, more negative talk, and that cycle just continues on and on. And then the final thing is, is that whoever wins, that as a society, you're going to do your best to be a good citizen. In, in England, you could have been part of the Labor Party or the Liberal Party uh, or the Tories, which is what the Conservative Party was. But if your party didn't win, you were going to be a good British citizen. You were going to do your best uh, to follow and make sure that you did everything that was within the bounds of your society. This is what happens when politics becomes about the extremes. It's the middle ground. It's those who are willing to make compromise and those who are willing to work together that all of a sudden find themselves on the outs. And that only creates more and more division. Uh, why is it that this matters to me? Uh, well, I, my first degrees were in political science. I've always loved the way politics interrelates. And then when I went on to theology school, looked at how politics and religion started working together. In fact, my first thesis was about politics and religion. And I look around our world today and I think to myself, when did we decide that the extremes were the ones who were going to make policy? We've always had extremes, as I've talked about, all the way back to the beginning of the Christian faith, even back into uh, the, the long history of the Jewish faith. There's always been extremes that have taken up responsibility in certain leadership positions, but there was always this ability to move back towards real conversation and real compromise. When we forget to talk to one another, that shuts down the relationship altogether. And no matter what the state of the relationship, it will only begin to deteriorate and die. And that's why it's so important for us to take the lessons of what happens when, like in the Middle East, an extremist group begins to act out on its own. It only is going to lead to more and more bloodshed and only to more and more division. We need to be careful of this, friends, within our own faith, within our own communities, that we're not allowing someone to tell us what we believe, 
but spending time with Jesus to really understand and learn what he teaches. I've used this example before. Uh, You cannot ask the question, what would Jesus do, unless you are willing to first look at what Jesus actually said and did. And I would encourage you to go to our website at journeywise.network and look at our new 360-day curriculum with Jesus, and it helps us to do just that. But not only to know Jesus, but it also helps us to understand where being a good citizen comes into, into practice in our faith as well. And what it means that you're not always going to get everything you agree for in this secular world of citizenship, but you can be good citizens. And Jesus does talk to us about being good citizens. But he also talks about our citizenship must come from a value that's deeper than just what we say we want or what our personal self-interest are. It must come from the self-interest of what is best for the community. And if we could all ask that question, As people of faith and people who believe in the power and the sanctity of relationship, we then would be able to work together to achieve important things for our community. I'd love to hear from you about this. I'd love for you to uh, share your question or your comment and send it to us at uh, anl at morewestcenter.org. That's anl at morewestcenter.org. Send us your comments, your thoughts, Uh, Again, this is just my opinion today, just one of the things I've noticed as I've been watching the news lately, that we are giving extremism a lot of say in our world. We're giving extremism a lot of votes. And unfortunately, though, we can communicate what we believe and and really set strong into that as believers in in our faith, that's not always going to be the best way that we do things in a community. In a community, we're going to have to compromise. We're going to have to look at the opinion of another person. We're going to have to be able to find the common ground. Uh, That's why it is so important. That's why the Constitution of the United States takes such uh, uh, pains in order to look for common ground and why that is important. Um, These were men of faith that began to look at compromise as part of being reasonable. And in our rational, reasonable way of approaching the world, we also have to look for that common ground as well. Well, friends, um, thank you for just letting me share a few moments with you as we've talked about uh, some of the things going on. Continue to pray for our world. Uh, Pray for the situation, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, These are conversations of broken promises that go back generation after generation. And we as Christians... Uh, we have a, a very ve- a vested interest there. Not only is it the Holy Land where most of our relics as Christians come from, but it is also a place where Palestinian Christians themselves, not Jewish, but also not Muslim, live. And they get caught in the middle. And so I want you to pray specifically for the Palestinian Christian who is living in that area. But pray that reasonable minds will bring its, themselves to the table and have conversation. And so that uh, that things can be worked out. And until that day, when we're all in front of Jesus, we can learn how to live for Jesus uh, as we live in a world uh, with those who come from many different faiths. All right, friends, journeywise.network. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. Be salt and light. You matter. Uh, Take a moment, if you would, to please hit that subscribe button. And we also need you to do a five-star rating. And then, of course, we would love a review. We are a ministry of JourneyWise Network, and we would love to hear back from you. So go to journeywise.network and send us a message that we can share. God bless you.